Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, creator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we're in our 10th week since announcing dry docking. So this is our 10th episode about uh, the work that we're doing towards dry docking the ship and our plans once we get into dry dock. It's always unfortunate when something bad happens to a museum ship. However, it has to happen to somebody. Like Somebody has to learn these lessons so that they get disseminated. And, and the thing I love the most about the museum ship field is, you know, we're a relatively small field. There, there's only a couple hundred ships and so only a couple thousand staff members total. So we get together every year and we talk. One of the things we're doing as we're preparing for New Jersey's dry docking is looking at all of the other major capital ship dry dockings that other museums have done in uh, recent years. And by recent years, I mean you can count on both hands the number of capital ships that have been dry docked by museums uh, in my lifetime. So we're, we're looking at all of these to see what went wrong and how we can learn from those. Many of you probably remember Intrepid being dry docked around uh, 2006. Her dry docking is interesting to us because of the dates that it goes over and the thing that went wrong. So we're going to be primarily talking about that. Her dry docking was specifically chosen because they were going to make some major upgrades to her pier to allow for more visitor access. Because of her location in New York City, Intrepid can get up to a million visitors a year, which is approximately 20 times as many visitors as Battleship New Jersey gets. So they had to set up more ticket windows, more space on the pier for people to walk, more benches for people to sit on. They had to make a bunch of accommodations for that number of people that we haven't had to make here at Battleship New Jersey. And their numbers have progressively gone up over time as more people find out that they're there in New York. And New York's become more of a tourist destination. So, everything makes sense. They had to make updates to the pier to be able to, um, to, be able to accommodate those people, which meant they had to move the ship away from the pier. So if you're going to move the ship away from the pier, and if you've got a bunch of money to do this, you might as well drop a little bit of that money on dry docking the vessel. Intrepid would not have been dry docked since uh, at least the 19, since at least the 1970s when she was taken out of service, and certainly not since the 1980s when she was opened up as a museum. So very very similar position to us. The museum had never done it. Um, no idea what condition the underwater hall was in. So the uh, I've been having trouble finding the exact numbers on what they spent on dry docking because, again, this was a, a major project. They had to move all of their ships away from the pier. They've got more than Intrepid there. They've also got Growler um, and, of course, the work on the pier. So it seems like they raised, and different sources online say different numbers, uh, newspaper articles before she goes into dry dock says it's going to cost about $60 million. Uh, newspaper articles afterwards say 70 million, but there's also a press release somewhere that says 115 million. I suspect that 115 number is both the money they spent and the expected revenue that they lost for the, the period of time that they were closed. Or it was just a source that had no idea what they were talking about, which is why it's important as a historian to always find multiple sources. Uh, so it, says that they were able to raise $35.5 million in federal funds, $5 million in state funds, and $17 million in city funds. Uh, so it's great to see that a museum ship is getting that kind of support. They closed down the ship on uh, October 1st, 2006, and they don't try to move her until a month later on November 6th, 2006. So they did a month's worth of work getting the ship ready to go. So the timeline of events, uh, October 1st, the museum closed to the public. So they take approximately a month to do all the work they need to to get the ship ready to tow. On November 6th, they attempted the uh, tow, but the ship ran aground. We're going to talk about that more in a minute and what this museum is doing uh, to learn from that mistake. Uh, on December 5th, they were able to move the ship. And then she was in dry dock at uh, Bayonne until uh, June 6th of 2007, so she was in dry dock for about six months. And then uh, she was moved to Staten Island, because they're still working on her pier for about another 18 months. And so they do a bunch of work on the ship 
uh, things that you can't do when there's a million visitors on board. Uh, so it's not until October 2nd, uh, 2008, that she returns home. And then November 8th, the Friday before Veterans Day, that she reopens to the public. So you can see there's, there's a month ahead of time and a month afterwards that they're getting the ship ready to tow and then getting her ready to open to the public. So the, the whole purpose for this video, the main shipping channel is always dredged and they dredged from the ship's berth to the channel was deep enough for the ship to go through. After moving the ship about 15 yards, her stern, probably her propellers, got stuck in the mud. So somewhere there was a berm. And uh, what I believe I remember happening, and somebody from Intrepid may say otherwise, the ship's berth was empty. The ship was rising and falling with uh, the tide. And the channel was empty, but there was like a berm right between the side of the ship and the, uh, the lane to get her out to the channel. And, and when they pulled her out onto that, that's where she got stuck. They thought they might have some issues. That's why they dredged. That's why they uh, went on the specific date that they did. November 6th was a uh, like astronomically high tide. just because of the moon's location, the sun's location, everything else. They were able to look at tide tables and say that that day would be the perfect day to go. Uh, they lightened a lot of uh, several hundred tons of liquid, pumped it out of the ship so that she would be lighter. But much like New Jersey, uh, Intrepid sits down a little bit by the stern. So that's the part that caught when they tried to take her out. At that point, they had six tugboats totaling 30,000 horsepower that tried to push her, and they were unable to. So they had to get Navy divers to come in and uh, suck the mud away. And uh, up there, much like here on the Delaware River, it's a lot of uh, silt, like really fine mud and grit. So it fills in very easily. So before the battleship came here around 2000, the Army Corps of Engineers dredged from the channel to our berth, and uh, they dredged where our berth was. The channel's supposed to be something like 45 feet minimum at mean lower low tide. What that means is there's uh, two low tides in a day. One of them tends to be lower than the other one. So whatever the average low tide over a certain period of time is, is what they're finding the average of in their surveys. So, uh, and the channel from the ship to the lane and our berth is supposed to be dredged out to about 40 feet. Now, we were worried that that had silted in over the last more than 20 years that we've been sitting here. Uh, and, and so over this winter, we sent divers down to look at the underside of the hull. And then we have uh, since and they confirmed that the underside of the hull is fine. And then we have since done a bathyographic survey with our engineering company, and they've run through, and uh, that's what this is right here. Uh, so it's our bathyographic survey, which is just a more in-depth hydrographic survey. So you can see around the edges, we've got the old Army Corps of Engineers uh, drawings. I'm not sure what, how long ago that was taken. And then you've got this uh, denser area in the middle where we had our engineers run the whole distance from the ship up to the channel to make sure that we're still seeing enough depth uh, for the ship to get out of there. And again, remember it's supposed to be 40 feet at mean lower low tide, and we only draw a max of 34 feet at the stern. So there are certainly some areas where it is filled in, particularly close to us, close to the, store, uh, the shore. There are some areas that are in the 30s, uh, what I suspect is happening over here on this side of the chart is where the port is. And so, especially over winter, there are always iron ore carrying ships brought in here. And so the tugboats push them in, pull them out. And so that's kicking up silt and pushing it over in our direction. And that's probably why some of this is silted in. But uh, the Delaware River has a pretty strong tidal flow and it has kept uh, a lot of stuff moving rather than settling in our berth. So, uh, the short version of this long rambling story uh, is that it is a real concern for ships, especially museum ships that are permanently moored, have been sitting here for a long time. Uh, and unfortunately, even though you do a lot of checks ahead of time, it's stuff like this still happens. Uh, and so we have done everything possible to check where the ship is sitting, uh, 
the channel, every, everywhere we're going to be moving this ship to make sure that uh, she can go there and we're not going to run aground and run into uh, extra unforeseen costs. I forgot to mention that uh, quarterly we take soundings off of the side of the ship just to make sure that the area around us isn't filling in. So that's, that's three different methods. We've done soundings, we've sent divers down, and now we've actually done like, like a bounce sonar off the seabed to see how much depth there is under the ship and in the places we're going to go. So that won't be what slows us down on our way to dry dock. There's a tremendous amount of planning that goes into dry docking any museum ship. Let us know in the comment section down below if there are any aspects of that you'd like to see us cover in a future video. We post these dry dock episodes every Wednesday, and we plan on continuing that until we've actually got the ship out of the water, and then hopefully we'll be able to film her in dry dock every single day. So let us know what you'd like to see in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. Really appreciate your support. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to continue donating to support the ship and this massive project. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about us in the museum. Thanks for watching.